So we spoke about the white matter and how that grows throughout life. With gray matter, it's a little bit different. The gray matter is thickening, and that's that those cell bodies and those dendritic branches out in the in the outer shell of the cortex. And it thickens in different parts of the brain at different rates throughout development, with the peak thickness overall happening around age 13. In general, it the parts that thicken most are the parts that you need first, vision and motor, um, your senses, and then slower your higher cognitive con functions, your executive, your frontal areas will thicken right around age 13. And here's some more data on that, on what kind of thickens when, sensory cortex around age 7, um, moving on to the motor cortex, primary motor cortex, supplementary motor cortex, and then age 13, medial, prefrontal, and cingulate cortex. Now those are the areas that are involved with um, many things, including error detection and error correction. Now remember, peak thickness is when things are all tangled and they have inefficient communication. This is what precedes pruning, so it's probably the most difficult time for children to manage tasks involving those areas because things are so thick and tangled. And what happens, hold on one second, there we go. Around age 13 with this peak thickness you've got in the um, cingulate cortex, this is really important because that's the part of the brain that's involved with error detection. And it turns out that that's also the part of the brain that's involved with error correction. Now this is a really important concept with respect to Montessori pedagogy because in Montessori pedagogy you want all the works to be self-correcting or for the ch child to have the ability to find their own mistakes and then correct their own mistakes right away. And it actually turns out that there's a biological reason for that. The part of our brain that notices we make mistakes seems to be the same part of our brain that wants to fix those mistakes. At least some of this early data suggests that. More research absolutely needs to be done, but it's really curious to notice that that is going on and to notice that this area is so heavily involved with error detection, kind of this self-monitoring uh, um, is peaking right around age 13, which in Montessori is the beginning of plane three. Really big changes happening for the child at that point in time. Now let's talk about connectivity of networks. So we have these um, different neurons that are getting connected to each other, but it's not a random connection. They connect to each other in order to work more efficiently and effectively in specific patterns. And usually when you're starting development, you'll have more local based connections, and then slowly over time you refine them and your connections get longer and longer. So when you're in this graphic, you can see at age 11, you need a lot of different localized areas for language, whereas at age 38 you're using fewer areas because those areas are refined. Stronger, longer connections develop over time based on experience, so you actually need less to do more. All right, And here's a great example of that. This particular connection called the arcuate fasciculus connects Wernicke's area, something you probably never thought you'd need to say, Wernicke's area, which is kind of the word box area in our temporal lobe near our ear, behind your ear, and then Broca's area, which is more in the frontal lobe. Broca's area handles the semantics or grammar of order, how words fit together to make sense, okay? Now, in this particular um, connectivity brand, tends to get to refine itself and matures right around age five. And that, in Montessori pedagogy, is just the age when you start to teach grammar work. So it's as if Dr. Montessori had, you know, a diffusion tensor imager in her brain and she could see when these neural networks were ready for more work. And, and here's just one example of that. So here's some more data on how those local connections give way to long range or global connections with age and experience. And they're divided into just a few areas that are interested. There's, of course, a lot more data on this. Um, the first one on senses and movements, these, these long blue marks indicate um, the long range connections that are, are forming. So how many long range connections? Um, 
and the efficiency of those connections, long-range connections. So you can see for primary sensory motor cortex with senses and movements, you've got a lot happening in those earliest years, right? And then the activity settles down a bit with a surge again during adolescence. Now for the paralimbic or emotional areas, you've got less happening in the earlier years, but a lot happening in that later elementary and adolescent periods where that activity is happening. Now the association networks is, I think you can think of that in terms of abstraction and creativity. And there's more of a linear development. But the first thing I want you to notice, the really important thing, is that the abstraction and creativity starts really to kick in around that age five um, time period. So that's why our teachings in the Montessori pedagogy are based on concrete, hands-on experiences before age five and slowly easing the child into abstraction after that age without jumping too quickly to abstraction because the those networks just aren't aren't prepared for it yet. Let's see if we can move ahead. There we go. So to do anything, I think you're getting the idea that we need the entire brain. You can't just have one part of it to do anything. You need everything to work together. And reading is a great example of that. For reading, you need the whole brain to be connected. So let's talk about what that means. First, the back of the brain, the occipital lobe, is involved in seeing the words. Then you have to attach form to those words. What does that word mean? And that happens more up with the word box and in the, tempor the um, temporal lobe. And then you've got to um, find some meaning to those words and look at all the different areas that are involved in finding meaning. It's not just one spot. You've got to connect all parts of the brain. And then you have to figure out what you're going to do about it. What do you think about what you've just learned? Are you going to say something? Are you thinking about it? What does it mean to you? And those are the different areas, the parietal lobe and, and um, frontal lobe are, are the areas involved in that. So you can see that everything's involved in order to do reading. It's like you have a reading committee in your brain. And if any of you ever work on committees, it's amazing that the brain can get anything done. I mean, committees are tough. Everybody's got to get along, right? And that's what happens in the brain all the time. That's why long, strong connections matter so much, because everybody has to work together. So you really can't think of the brain without also thinking of the biology of the entire body. And one idea that can bring this to mind is how connected movement is with thinking or cognition. And they've done some interesting research on the cerebellum, which is this part back here in the lower back of your brain. Um, which is like in cats, this is, they have a really big cerebellum because it helps them with all their balance and movement. So traditionally we've thought of this part of the brain as kind of the movement part of the brain, cerebellum. But the red areas and the blue areas are showing you that there's both cognition and movement um, events happening in those parts of the brain. So you really can't separate one from the other and they're dispersed throughout the brain. They're dispersed. So, so what does this mean? So everybody's working together. You've got to have practice in order to learn things. And you have to do things again and again. So skills are developing dynamically over time and with repetition. Here's how that looks. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, I'm having a hard time showing the illustration here. 